still lingering about. What's wrong? A hunter unnerved by a few beasts. <laughs> no matter. Without fear in our hearts, we're little different from the beasts themselves. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Bloodborne Lore. I am Silvermont, or Alex, and in this episode we'll be talking about another hunter found in Yharnam. But not just any hunter, the hunter of hunters, Eileen. And let's start with her name, shall we? Eileen comes from the name Helen, which gives it a likely meaning of light, shining light and so forth. And whilst it's not entirely relevant, it is a little interesting to note that Eileen has links to the name Avalyn and Evelyn, which I'm sure you'll all recognise as certain ranged weapons. Incidentally, I don't believe Eileen ever gives us her name, does she? But we learn it through in-game items which refer to her by name. That is the only source of her actual name, as far as I'm aware. Even the credits only lists her as Hunter of Hunters, if I'm not mistaken. How many characters can you think of, just off the top of your head, who haven't given us their name? But, then again, perhaps formal introductions would be a waste of time for a Hunter of Hunters. So. Who is Eileen? What role does she play in the game? In a way, she plays the part of wise old mentor. She doesn't have much to teach the good hunter, but she will offer nuggets of advice and her own form of encouragement upon your first meeting with her. Prepare yourself for the worst. There are no humans left. They're all flesh-hungry beasts now. It isn't until our second encounter with her that we learn her true reason for being here, in Yarnum. She is a hunter, but her prey just so happens to be other hunters. Those who have become addled with blood. We'll talk more on what that could possibly mean in a bit. Shortly after she explains this to us, Eileen remarks that we should stay away from the Erden tomb where we fought Gascoigne, as she has unfinished business there. And if one ventures down for a gander, they will encounter Father Gascoigne's hunting partner, Henrik. Eileen herself will soon make an appearance, and together she and the good hunter will put down the mad old hunter. After this she will profess her thanks, but remark that the hunting of hunters should be left to her. Try to keep your hands clean. Lay the hunting of hunters to me. <laughs> is that because it is her job, not ours? Or that we run some other type of risk when hunting humans? Notice that during her first encounter, she tells us that there are no humans left. They are all flesh-hungry beasts now, implying that all of the huntsman enemies, the, the villagers with pitchforks and so forth, they're no longer human, but I think it is safe to assume that hunters who kill other hunters and other humans, they run the risk of becoming blood addled, and that is one reason it should be left to her, lest we become what she is hunting in the first place. Or perhaps she doesn't want us stepping on her toes. The next meeting with Eileen is typically the last you will have with her. Like most NPCs in Bloodborne, her questline is sadly rather short. However, it can go a few different ways. If you have not gone through her quest in the normal manner, or otherwise you've become a blood adult hunter, she will hunt you in the Grand Cathedral. During this encounter, she seems rather frantic and comes out with some odd words. The hunt makes hunters mad. <laughs> the beasts cannot be stopped! What good hunters now? Your blood is mine! A hunter's blood for me! Death to hunters! Enough of this terrible dream! All hunters must die. <laughs> if anything, she seems to be the one adult here. But the more likely outcome is that the good hunter will find her grievously wounded on the steps of the Grand Cathedral. Her injuries presumably coming from the bloody crow of Canehurst, who lurks nearby. A formidable opponent too, but putting him down will earn Eileen's favour, 
insofar as she will decide that you may be a worthy successor, a worthy hunter of hunters. A job that bears no honour, but one that she feels we may be up to. Following this, it's impossible to know what happened to Eileen. She remarks that she took enough blood to save an old woman, and her last in-game words are, let me rest a while, I'll be fine, just wait. And later she will vanish from that spot. Whether or not she dies, I feel is left entirely open to your imagination. Personally, I feel that she does, but there are good arguments to back both sides of that debate. So what is Eileen's role in the game? What is her purpose? Gascoigne served to demonstrate that we are not alone, and that hunters are at risk, a great risk of becoming beasts. Eileen's role is perhaps not too different. Gascoigne showed us that we can become a beast, and Eileen, her questline demonstrates that, well, it might not strictly be a beast, but blood adult hunters are clearly monsters of another type. She can't be summoned, but we can fight alongside her now and then. Frankly, I feel like she could have been a good summon. She also serves to introduce us to one of the three oaths or covenants that the game has to offer, and hers is generally the easiest to obtain. The Hunter of Hunters play a role that you could, I suppose, compare with the Dark Moon Blades and Blue Sentinels from Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2, perhaps best compared with the latter of those two. When the undead in Dark Souls 2 develop an interest in the blood of other undead, the Blue Sentinels are those who both protect sane or healthy undead, <laughs> healthy undead, yeah, and hunt down the Brotherhood of Blood. We don't know how many members make up the Hunter of Hunters, but we do know that typically the badge that, you know, marks you as a Hunter of Hunters, the badge is passed down from one to another, usually to an outsider from the Hinterlands which I think means it is fair to assume that most of their members come from the Hinterlands. Does this mean Eileen comes from the Hinterlands? Perhaps. She does have a rather distinct accent when compared with the other Yarnamites, after all. Likewise, the Hunter of Hunters seem to take part in what can only be described as pagan rituals. Hunters of Hunters dress as crows to suggest sky burial. The first Hunter of Hunters came from a foreign land, and gave the dead a virtuous native funeral ritual, rather than impose a blasphemous Yarnum burial service upon them, with the hope that former compatriots might be returned to the skies, and find rest in the hunter's dream. Is that referenced foreign land the hinterlands? Perhaps. But the native funeral, it certainly reminds me of the Shrine of Storms from Demon Souls. What do you think? The island shrine of the Shadow Men, who worship storms and mourn the dead. Here, the storm beasts fly above and souls of the dead inhabit empty skeletons to move about freely. The dead, given seals of the hero by the adjudicator, are taken by the Shadow Men's shrine to be purified and mourned in the storm. After purification, hero's remains are offered to the Storm King. His wings cover the sky, and he is accompanied by storm beasts. Like a huge flying stingray, the Storm King is the embodiment of the thoughts of Shadow Men from hundreds of years ago. I'm not saying Bloodborne takes place in the same world as Demon Souls, but those sky burials. When I heard sky burial, it of course reminded me of the Shrine of Storms in some ways. And that's not the only link the Hunter of Hunters have with the sky. Eileen's weapon, and indeed the weapon passed down amongst Hunter of Hunters, the Blade of Mercy. Not only is it one of the oldest weapons we can obtain, but it is also forged from a mineral that supposedly fell from the heavens. Which isn't exactly rare in the fantasy genre, forging weapons from sky metal is a common trope, but an interesting one to think about in Bloodborne, given what we know of the sky and the cosmos, which may or may not be one. A special trick weapon passed down among Hunter of Hunters, one of the oldest weapons of the workshop, splits into two when activated. The weapon's warped blades are forged with Siderite, a rare mineral of the heavens. Siderite exists in the real world too. It is a paramagnetic mineral, mostly made up of iron, that, when heated, 
becomes drawn to magnetic fields. Could that play into the activation that involves sparking the two blades? But you might be thinking, what does paramagnetic mean? Simply put, there is diamagnetism, paramagnetism, and ferromagnetism. Diamagnetism means it is not magnetic. Ferromagnetism means it is, for example, your fridge magnets. And paramagnetism means it is magnetic, but only under the right circumstances. Such as when a magnetic field is applied. Good example, liquid oxygen. It's not exactly something you would consider magnetic, is it? But it is still affected by magnetism because of the oxygen. Am I the only one who finds any of that interesting? Probably, but I thought it was worth noting at any rate. Incidentally, the burial blade is also made of siderite and utilises a similar magnetic activation, whereas many other trick weapons are more mechanical by nature. Take the saw cleaver, the saw spear. That is transformed simply by flicking it out. It's quite simple. The burial blade has a very complex and almost magnetic looking activation where the blade is connected to the, the shaft, the handle. Either way, Burial Blade and the Blade of Mercy, they are the oldest trick weapons that we know of, and the description of the Burial Blade shares other links with the Blade of Mercy too. A masterpiece that defined the entire array of weapons crafted at the workshop. Its blade is forged with siderite, said to have fallen from the heavens. Gammon surely saw the hunt as a dirge of farewell, wishing only that his prey might rest in peace, never again to awaken to another harrowing nightmare. Would you not say that is granting a form of mercy? Would you not say the first ending of the game, the Yarnum Sunrise ending, would you not say that is Gem and granting us mercy? Hmm. Maybe there are other links between Eileen, Gem and the Hunter of Hunters, or maybe not. But they are important, and more importantly than being important, they are interesting to consider. As for Eileen herself, her mask is easily compared with the classic Plague Doctor mask. For good reason, in fact. Beyond the obvious that they look the same, both hold sense in the beak. The Plague Doctor's beak contains strong or sweet-smelling materials, herbs, mint, lavender and so forth. This was thought to protect the Doctor from sickness that's carried through the air, and perhaps more realistically, protect them from nasty smells. Eileen's beak, on the other hand, contains what is likely the same incense used by Ariana and many of the citizens of Yarnum to ward off beasts. You know those little red lanterns outside many of the homes? That's the same incense, I'm fairly certain. Probably the same incense that is burning in Erden Chapel. And probably due to that incense, Eileen's armour has extremely high resistance to Frenzy. Amongst the highest found in the game, in fact. Which makes sense, if you think back on what the Hunter of Hunters has been doing. She is hunting those who have been blood addled, who are, in a way, frenzied. So it would only make sense that she seeks to protect herself from that. From the sweet smell of blood. I wish I could say Eileen has a happy ending. Alas, happy endings in Yarnum just don't go hand in hand. Although perhaps... We should be glad that, compared to some, her ending isn't all that bad. Even if it does involve her death, she successfully managed to hand down her badge, her job, and finally is given the chance to rest. Like with Gehrman, she is old, and perhaps at this point, all she can long for is release. You still have dreams? Tell the little doll I said hello.